The Biofilic Leadership Summit is the only multi-day conference entirely dedicated to biophilic projects, principles, and research, bringing together the top industry leaders in an intimate, natural setting to network, build partnerships, and learn from each other. This year's summit will explore biophilic placemaking and how we can use biophilic principles to promote health, happiness, and vitality in public spaces. In addition to fascinating presentations, delicious farm-to-table meals at Serenby, and cocktails, this year's summer will feature a selection of biophilic experiences like forest bathing, bird watching, and more. So join us in Serenby for the 6th Annual Biophilic Leadership Summit from March 24th to March 26, 2024. Learn more about the summit and register today at biophilicsummit.com. That's biophilicsummit.com. We hope to see you there. Hi, I'm Monica Olson. And I'm Jennifer Walsh. And you're listening to the Biophilic Solutions Podcast, where every other week we sit down with experts and thought leaders across industries in order to explore the innate connection between humans and nature and why we need nature to thrive. We truly believe that in order to tackle the global environmental problems we're facing, we as humans must reconnect to the natural world and come to a better understanding of how we fit in and how we are so interconnected. So in every episode, we'll interview new guests that help us uncover and highlight nature-based solutions to get us on a path to greater health, tackling climate change, and ultimately getting outside and connecting with nature. So let's get to today's episode. Hi, Jennifer. Hey, Monica. How are you feeling? Ugh, just getting over a cold, so I sound a bit stuffed up. Okay, well, what are we doing today? Is this the David Orr Part 2? Is this the David Orr Bonus? What are we calling this? This is a great question. So this conversation we had with David Orr after our interview ended, and it's a little off the cuff. So we're going to call it a bonus episode. Okay, I like that. That's perfect. Yes, we kept the recording going as we wrapped with David and ended up having another absolutely fascinating conversation with him and our producer, Katrina. Yes, I love that Katrina popped in because you guys don't typically hear from her and she has amazing insight. So we talked about how can we activate people to get involved without burning them out? How can we be realistic about the problems we face while also staying optimistic? And we also get into the flaws baked into the system. I know we sometimes talk about the system as part of the problem. And it's a very timely conversation about Roe versus Wade and gun control. I can't even talk about that right now. And the role that tech plays in our society. Yes. And during our conversation about how we balance anger with hope, David gave us one of the most amazing metaphors I've heard yet. Yeah, I know the one you're talking about, and it really resonated with me too. So for anyone that feels overwhelmed right now and angry, but unsure how to move forward, I think this conversation will be very encouraging. Absolutely. David really has a way of putting things into perspective. I know he sure does. So let's get to our bonus episode with David Orr. That was great. That was amazing. I know, David, can you just like hang out with us all the time? All day. It's so important. And I think you had a Carter Center on your last tour that was supposed to happen. So hopefully you'll come to Atlanta for this next tour. Well, yeah, we do. And we're trying also to organize an event in Montgomery, Alabama. Oh. So we're That'd be great. looking over a book tour with events. Montgomery's on the list. Fantastic. Atlanta's on the list. So forth. Yeah, well, and you know me and Steve, like we'd love to host you or if there's like a dinner or something that we could do at CRV to support it, you let us know because we would love to do that. Yeah, that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. That's for sure. I'll come yeah. down to that for sure. Yeah, yeah. Our residents, it's kind of one of those things where they're regular people, right? It's nothing mm -hmm. special about them, if you will. Like we, everybody moved for maybe they have a commonality, but they're a group that I think, and Katrina has been involved with a bunch of different activities that residents have done, but I think they're a group that it's an opportunity to activate them in a way. Mm -hmm. And Katrina and I've talked about like, is that a book club? What is that thing that we could educate and activate them? Because again, they're just regular people, right? But they do have an affinity for community and nature. Right. And even if they have disparate views and whatever, right, background, right. Right. they're a special group that I think we could activate as influencers at minimum mm -hmm. just to have conversations with people and to be willing to have the conversations. And I think that's something that we haven't mm -hmm. quite figured out. We haven't really tried to do it, but I think that that's an opportunity for us to start the citizens collective with them. Yeah. 
that would be great. One of the things we're trying to do with the universities we're involved in is, is to get them to look through, you think of what happens at a university. They teach, they sponsor research, they convene events, they do counseling, they do career planning, mm -hmm. they have alumni, and lots of other things. So if you take each of those functions, so what we're trying to do is to get our group of four university administrators and ask for access to, in this case, you're talking about the alumni. Imagine getting the alumni from these organizations all involved. Yes. If you can get 5% of them, that's huge. And that ties yeah. Bill McKibben's work on what he calls the third act, which is basically people my age bracket or a good bit younger involved. And they've been around a block a time or two. They have some money. They know how things work and they yep. have spare time. So the retired people are forced to reckon with. I'm looking retired oh, yeah. People with the younger generation say the best of the talents at school. So we're trying to organize now also student-run events mm. about, because they're going to be the brunt of foolishness of our generation and so forth. So student-run events. And also some face-offs with students doing podcasts with board of trustee members and I love that. faculty and uh, administrators. Oh, so I know. This is not a time for business. We have to be, you know, again, our ideas are too puny for our circumstances. I think we have to be thinking of what does it mean as when things are in such peril? Mm. And you don't have to be an alarmist coming to that view. You just pay attention. Yep. Yeah. And that's the bigger thing that I think we talk about. And hopefully, and, and I don't know, I'm just going off on a tangent here, but we hope to try and have these conversations be realistic and thoughtful, but hopeful rather than, and not to say that there isn't a place. And I do listen to some of those conversations and podcasts, but that angry mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> bad guy, which I get fossil fuel, you know, like there are bad guys, but it's harder to want to sit in that space when it's just angry and divisive and othering, mm -hmm. even though there are those things we can say X and Y did bad things, but thinking of it more from a this is why I love, like, if I could just sit in college forever, professors, because the majority come to these topics in a very rational, thoughtful way, rather than spitfire, and which we need a little bit of that. But I'm trying to figure out where that balance is. I mean, it's not really our style to be angry and aggressive, but how do you be radical? I like that you said biophilia is radical, and I kind of, I'm, I don't know, something about that I like. Yeah. How do we be a little bit radical without being off-putting to the general public? Because we have to bring the middle into yeah. these conversations. It well, can't just it's the decide. same. Jeez, I'm not emotional about your question. I just have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I am emotional about your question, though. Uh, well, yeah, it's a little bit like making a very good dish as a cook. You don't want too much hot stuff in it. You want just enough to give it flavor. I love and, that. And, uh, great, great point. So well, salt in the stew is small by volume, large by effect. It changes the flavor of it. Mm. You need some of that. I don't want to call it anger, but you need something that's very direct. And yeah. Cool, but not all of it. You're exactly right. you got to have it so it's digestible mm -hmm. without roll aids or whatever. <laughs> I'm reading a book right now called Don't Even Think About It, which is a climate book that talks about the communication of climate by... David Marshall, maybe. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he's like anger creates action, right? When we get angry, we act. I mean, look at all the protests around Roe right now, right? Right. So that is one way to create change is to get people angry. <laughs> but I'm just always noodling, like, what's the best way forward from a communication style? You think of movement as an ecosystem and you mm -hmm. need some first order decomposers, you need some integrators, you need all kinds of things. So, Monica, if you want to be calm and rational and you have that bearing about you, you really want somebody pounding. You really want Katrina to pound the table. <laughs> <laughs> it, makes you appear, it makes you appear then really a whole lot more rational than you otherwise might appear. Which sometimes... Jennifer, you got to get angry. If somebody says angry. <laughs> and if Katrina gets pissed off enough, she feels self-righteous and people need to see a little bit of that. And then Jennifer, you can come in as a mediator and so forth. But there's kind of an ecosystem. You need your radicals. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You need that flavor in the stew that gives it a little bit of tang or whatever. So I don't mind people being off the wall sometimes. I sure can be. No, I do like that. I want the AOCs. I do want that. And I guess I'm thinking of a few different podcasters that just 
anytime I listen, it's just so mm. angry. And I'm like, oof, I really love your message, but the way you're translating, and it maybe it's my age too, because so maybe like the Gen Z and the millennials, my kids want that. I don't know. So I think it also depends on who your target is. To me, it's not so much the anger. It's, it's like the doom and gloom. And this idea that like it's out of our hands almost or like the powers yeah. that be are creating this situation. And there's it, it, sometimes there's an, like this notion mm-hmm. of there's nothing we can do about it. That's where the disconnect is for me. I understand the anger and the like yeah. fire and brimstone. But then I think you have to move into like, okay, now here's what we can do. If you take Roe as an example, you know, someone's posting a million quotes from Ruth Bader Ginsburg and and like, here's why it's bad or whatever. I'm like, mm. no, like, what can you do? Like, tell people what they can do, direct them to an action step that's going to actually help. And then I think that's where I'm like, I like the energy. If it moves in that direction and it's always with yeah. like, what can we do and what do we have the power and what's in our hands to affect? That's really well said. In the movement, in my experience, a little bit like biomimicry or Children in Nature Network, when we worked on the Lewis Center in the 90s, that was just love and peace. I mean, I got to raise money for it. The college didn't put any money into it, but I didn't sell a building. I was selling ideas mm. about, about forestry, about health, about landscape, about clean water. And so I brought in all my radical friends, John Todd and Nancy Todd, to design the living machine for the building and so forth and so on. But you could bring people in, and that was easy because you had something physical to see. Sure. And there's no Republican or Democratic photovoltaic array. Or, <laughs> but in the case of abortion rights, you have a different kind of problem. It's harder to stay cool. I mean, I think you need to figure out mechanisms by which you do that. But it's harder to stay cool when you're talking about your body. Yep. Mm-hmm. The same yep. is true with lynching. Yep. Lynching also is their right to kill, brutalize. So when it gets really close and personal, those issues become really explosive. And we need mechanisms by which we handle that. Mm-hmm. But that's a case where the flaws in our democracy led to a terrible situation with abortion and lots of other things. Mm-hmm. There are three justices in the Supreme Court appointed by a minority president who, to me, Trump is probably illegitimate. He had definitely had help from Russia getting elected and so forth. And mm-hmm. he was still a minority president. Mm-hmm. Hillary got three million more votes than he did. And that's because of gerrymandering. That's because of the Electoral College. That's because of flaws baked into our democracy. Sure. So if you want these kinds of troubles that put bodies on the line and bodies at risk and then the temperature goes up, you Mm -hmm. have to have a system that adequately represents people across the board. Right now, the Supreme Court, the people who have been elected to the Supreme Court overwhelmingly have been elected or selected and elected by a minority of Americans Mm -hmm. because our Constitution now favors rural areas over, you know, a representative from Montana has a whole lot more power than a representative from California or New York. And those are flaws of our democracy that have to be fixed. And that would be easy to fix. But the consequence of a flawed democracy making these kinds of decisions, then we get into a real mess. That's not a cure, Katrina, for what you're saying. No, but it's a good point. And it's Boy, true. having those kind of things come up in that particular fashion. Once there are 70% of the, the public says they you can't ban abortion, you can't have life protected. There's a larger conversation, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Right. If you say... I got into an argument once with a, uh, in a public event some years ago in South Carolina. And a woman stood up and she got into abortion. And my talk was not on abortion, but she got into abortion. And I said, well, if the right to life is your thing, and I understand that. And I'm, I'm agree, right to life is the important thing. But if that is a philosophy, not an ideology, that philosophy doesn't permit you to go down a cafeteria line and take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. The mm-hmm. philosophy is consistent all the way through. So if you're ready for the right to life, then you have to ban uh, assault rifles and guns. You have to be for the rights of those children to be fed and adequately housed and cared for once they're born. Abolish the death penalty. You have to be for the Endangered Species Act. You have to be against war. All yeah. those things are matters of life. So if your position is you're pro-life, mm-hmm. well, pro-life is not the first item in a cafeteria. It's <laughs> a philosophy that says you've got to carry that all the way through. Right. That debate has not happened yet. And as far as I know, no Democrat has ever said to Republican counterparts trying to ban abortion that uh, that is so inconsistent because you also vote against 
uh, assault rifle bands. Weapons on guns. Mm-hmm. You know, they kill what 35, 40,000 people a year die with guns. Yeah. So those inconsistencies need to be aired, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think right now you can air those and so many Republicans don't care. Like they just ignore it. And so it's more about educating the public to ask those questions Mm -hmm. because so much of what we're talking about, I feel like is very in the weeds. And I just don't know if people understand it or go deep into these things. Well, and I think to your point, like people do get apathetic and then think, of them they're like oh i'm just i'm just not political or like i just stay out of it because it's a bunch of noise and i think when you start to air some of these inconsistencies and certain ideologies and Mm -hmm. then i think people start being like well yeah i agree or but it's about having those conversations and i mean to monica's point like bringing people in in a way that is not going to immediately just put them on edge. Mm -hmm. Like I've had to stop listening to the daily podcast every day or because I just like, it just makes me crazy. Like I want to be informed. Mm -hmm. I want to be keeping up with the news, but I think there is a lot of like, just like noise. A lot of noise. And and it it gets overwhelming. And I think there is kind of a balance between the appropriate level of like anger and lighting a fire and not burning people out to the point that they just Mm -hmm. can't engage with any of it. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem I think we have is we are advertised at Mm. relentlessly. Yes. And from Edward Bernays, who was a nephew of Sigmund Freud way back when, when he devised the first uh, major U.S. advertising firm, they figured out how you appeal to that part of the brain that we associate with the id. Mm. Fear, comparison, vulnerability, anger, and so forth. We have one number I've seen, and I don't know if this is an accurate number, is we see or hear or are exposed to something like 5,000 advertisements or commercial messages a day. Oh, God. Now, cut that number in half. I don't know what the right number is, but from a Nike swoop on a ball cap to a pop-up ads on your computer. Here, I, I'm, I'm marketing right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, being advertised too. I'm being advertised twice. <laughs> you get the therapy part of that. That's, that's where the brain is that aimed to hit. Is it the love part? Of the part? Hopefully the hopeful, the hopeful part. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that, what that means is it's a large-scale experiment on the mind of a creature that is fundamentally visual. Mm-hmm. So that something like 70% or even a bit more of our sensory apparatus is connected to our eyes, so what we see. And it makes us vulnerable to all kinds of things. I mean, we grew up as a species in the plains of Africa where eyesight was really important. A little ripple in the grass out there, you had to pay attention to because that could be a lion. And you're part of the food chain. But now that has been exploited for a century. And we're the products of several generations now of relentless advertising. Shoshana Zuboff, his book, Surveillance Capitalism. If you haven't read it, put it on your to-read list. Okay. She's also was on one of our podcasts and has a chapter in this new book coming out. Oh, great. But what they're mining now, every time you go online, they're mining you. Mm-hmm. And she points yeah. out that you're getting something, but they're getting you. They're figuring we're the, out. We're the you, product. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Isn't, what is that a quote? Like if you're not paying for a service, then you are the product. Yeah. It's like Facebook. Yeah. We're the product at Facebook yeah. or Meta or wherever they are. Right. That is the unfortunate reality of our time. And I had dinner several weeks ago with a guy in Boulder, Colorado, who is one of those people who knows uh, the inside of how computers work. And you remember Cambridge Analytica? Yep. Mm-hmm. The successor organization is actually in Boulder called GLUE, I think it is, or G G L I. They're getting ready to unleash AI-initiated political campaigns. Oh, boy. Targeted at audiences, and they know exactly what turns them on, what turns them off. They've studied this. And so psychology departments no longer have, if they ever did, a mastery or a monopoly on how the human mind works. It's now these computer companies, the successors to Cambridge Analytica. And so political campaigns, uh, he was warning our group in Denver that they're about to get unbelievably nasty and very effective. 
scary. This again is a political issue. We've given way too much power to these companies and their yeah. algorithms to search our inner beings and they can tell you. I remember working as a consultant once to Walmart and I was doing this. He's a design class and I asked my design class, should I do this? Should I go down to Walmart and help them design their buildings? And Amory Lovins and I were supposed to get down together and their answer was interesting. Some said, no, you can't do it because they're evil. Mm -hmm. Some said, do it only if they pay you, which I'd refuse. And some said, do it, but on your terms, which was interesting because I said, okay, that makes sense. So our terms were, and I went down twice, but it was interesting because they understood their stores in a way they could tell you what a skylight in a certain part of a store meant for sales in that amount of square footage. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievable. They were building very good buildings, actually, and have continued to build pretty good buildings. But they were already figuring out what biomimicry in effect, daylighting had to do with our propensity to buy. Right. Huh. And this, by the way, is one of the dangers of biomimicry. You can make indoor spaces so wonderfully attractive and there's white sound and sunlight that people stay indoors. Yeah. You yeah. can build malls and gambling places. There's a book, I've forgotten the author's name. It was a Princeton University Press book, but it was called Addiction by Design. And the design arts for gambling casinos are so good that you can get people to gamble until they have heart attacks, they've spent out their money, they have bodily emergencies they ignore, they just sit there at this machine, mm -hmm. and it's designed to keep them hooked. In the same way that, rather like Facebook and its likes and all those mm -hmm. algorithms that keep people online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a design issue, but that, that becomes a political issue, too. Because politics yeah. is the way we have to solve that. Either politics or people just mass rebel by whatever they're selling. Yeah, yeah. And you think that if we understand, right, that it's being done to us, that's a start. <laughs> but we seem to continue to let it happen to us because yeah. we talk ourselves out of like, oh, well, Facebook's just a, it's just a cost of doing business and everybody needs to be on there. And it is like a fear of not being in it. I don't know. I admire people who aren't on it. <laughs> well, I'm not on Facebook, partly because I don't want to spend the time on Facebook, and partly because I have this political reaction to anything Zuckerberg's for. Yeah, sure. Understand. Um, <laughs> he needed to stay at Harvard for those last two years and take ethics courses. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. That's true. But I think our devices have outrun our capacity to use them to good effect. Mm. Yeah. And we, we call this creative disruption or to be disruptive. And we take disruption as the goal of most of these technological things. And I think the end result looks something like Mariupol in Ukraine. It's just mm. disruption. Yeah. I can see. We don't govern technology. This is one of the things that we have in the book. I've asked Polly Jean Buck and David Gust and two different people to take on the question of how democracies might govern technology. Hmm. But we deploy things long before we understand their effects or impacts. Definitely. I'm excited for the book because I think asking those questions of what if and what could be a more just X, Y, and Z, I think yeah. playing that out is important to start the conversation. Because a lot of times we're not even getting that thoughtful. It's just, it should be this way or it should be that way mm -hmm. instead of, what if, and then let's convene and converse around that concept. Yeah, our philosophy of technology is kind of a uh, version of gee whiz. <laughs> it's so new, it's exciting. And there was a man at MIT who wrote a book called Computer Power and Human Reason back in 1976. He was one of the computer scientists that helped revolutionize the field. And he held forth for three days at our event with a group of students from all over the country. They loved him, but he was skeptical about what computers would do or should do. And he was just so wise about these prosthetic devices. He was a refugee from Nazi Germany. He had some understanding of the capacity for human evil and fallibility and so forth. But we don't have a mechanism to say, huh, that's interesting, possibly useful. Let's put it on the shelf and study it. Mm -hmm. And when Newt Gingrich, I mean, to beat up on Newt Gingrich in this for the Office of Technology Assessment, which was the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment in 1994. And it's a little bit like ever since being on a twisty mountain road going at high speed, dark night, and you turn the headlights off. You have no capacity to see what these things do, what they do in relation to other innovations. 
And the same is true all across the board. I mean, you think of Roundup as a solution to farming problems. And so we made Roundup ready soybeans, and now you got Roundup's glyphosate is known carcinogen. The atomic bomb and Facebook. I mean, we have all these things and we celebrate innovation without understanding what its costs are. We don't read the fine print. Mm-hmm. There's no mechanism in a society that worships creative destruction. Uh, that's a phrase from Joseph Schumpeter, the old Austrian economist. But as, as a philosophy of technology, it's really a two-edged sword. I mean, innovation helps in a lot of ways. I mean, I'm glad the folks invented the vaccine for COVID. I'm glad they did that. And that was incredible innovation. But also the structure of the problem was that you have this global economy that moves heavy things long distances, which means it can move light things like viruses long distances. Mm-hmm an economy that doesn't put boundaries around land. And so you have invasive species invading because we're invading the territory. You have then the virus comes out of these forests in China in the labs in Wuhan. So the system was designed to create pandemics. The last thing I'm saying, I'm going to have to run, is I think in this world, I don't think there are many accidents. I think there's the working out of the rules of the system. Mm -hmm. Show me a growth economy and growth at all costs, powered by fossil fuels, no restraints, And I'll show you climate change and acid rain and ocean acidification. It's a logical thing built into that thing. The rules of the capitalist economy had no provision for natural systems. Yeah. A whole other podcast is valuing nature, putting Mm -hmm. a value on nature. I can't remember what book I was reading, but it's like Amazon, the company has more value. We put in place more value on that than Amazon, the place. And I think that's a whole other podcast conversation about yeah. how did we get here but and i think the chapter on if we understood ecology and understood a little bit more would the constitution have built in yeah something to consider the value of nature well think about selling amazon the company taking the profits to buy amazon the forest and preserve it yeah and you do two things right you get rid of amazon the company and you preserve the forest that's genius. I like that. <laughs> okay, we're going to leave it on the big idea. I think cool. we probably have a bonus episode here. I yeah. Think this, this <laughs> second half, I can't figure out how we're going to use it, but I think it's a bonus episode we're going to do, David. So That'd be great. Hey, great to see you all three. Of you. Thanks so much for your Thank time. Thank you so much. Oh, this was great. Let us know how we can help in any way. For sure. I'll keep you posted on the book. Please I've do. got your email addresses so I can yeah. you know about uh, coming events and so forth. And wait, let me know when you come to New York. We'll get together. Well, New York, I'd love to. We're trying to get our legal team on Constitution at Pace University, NYU, and the Brennan Center. Focused on, wow. Yeah, we're doing the chapter on the Constitution is coming out at New York Group. So, Wow. Very cool. That's great. Hey, good to see all of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we would love for you to follow us on your favorite podcast app. Give us a five-star rating and please leave us a review. It really goes such a long way towards helping us reach a wider audience and sharing these amazing interviews and solutions with the world. Absolutely. So thanks so much for following and reviewing the podcast. And we'll be back with another amazing interview in two weeks. You're now a part of the Biophilic Movement. Movement.